open up to Acts chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 40 for a sermon I've entitled The Gospel Beyond the Pale. But we're going to start reading in verse 1 just to get some context. So Acts 8, starting with verse 1. Follow along as I read. Here's what it says. Now Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And on that day a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem and they were all scattered throughout all the region of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them into prison. And then our text this morning. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was being said by Philip as they heard and saw Uh, the signs which he had performed. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Beyond the pale? Are you familiar with that phrase? Now, according to the Oxford Dictionary, when someone goes beyond the pale, he or she is acting in a way that is unacceptable as far as their behavior. A few years back, President Donald Trump criticized a federal judge who was presiding over a case on immigration. Trump suggested that because the man had Mexican heritage, the judge might be biased in the case. The Republican Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, uh, went on television and said that Trump's uh, comments were racist and beyond the pale. Actually, when he put that phrase in beyond the pale, President Trump, there were a lot of articles that came up. Well, what does that term mean? Where does it come from? Well, the word pale, like in P-A-L-E, comes from the Latin word palace, which means a stake, uh, like the kind you would drive into the ground. In the 1400s, when the Normans invaded Ireland, they set up fencing across the territories that they controlled. And beyond the pale was that area where the wild Irish lived. If you wanted to stay away from those hooligans, you needed to stay within the pale. Later, Catherine the Great of Russia set aside a certain area in her empire called the Pale Settlement. Jews were allowed to live within this area, but only in rare exceptions could they live outside of the Pale. Life for Jews inside was difficult. There was a lot of poverty. If you think of the movie Fiddler on the Roof, that took place in Anatevka, which was in the Pale. It was illegal for the dangerous for the Jews to go outside of the Pale, but after the pogroms in Russia began, two million of them did, leaving the country and emigrating most of them to the United States. Now, I titled my sermon Beyond the Pale because, or the Gospel Beyond the Pale, because it, after the persecution of the Christians in uh, Jerusalem broke out, Philip did the unexpected, and for many, the unthinkable. He went to Samaria to preach the gospel to the people there. Now, in doing so, he not only went on beyond the pale, but he also started the expansion of the gospel to people other than Jews. And so this morning, as we consider this important turning point in the history of the early church, we want to think about some ways that God might try to get us out of our comfort zone to bring the gospel to those who need to hear it. So why don't we pray and get into the text. Father God, I do pray for grace and mercy. Help us as we look at the text. This was an important turning point for the church and one that uh, we want to understand so that we can give the gospel to those who are around us. So bless us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, all of chapter 8 speaks of the expansion of the gospel outreach. In verses 1 to 24, you have the work done in Samaria by uh, Philip. And then in uh, verses 26 to 40, you have him speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, it's going to take us three weeks to go through this. So the first part, we only want to do the first four verses. So what do we see in the text related to Philip and his ministry among the Samaritans? Well, we can outline it this way. The first thing you find is his message, his message. And that's going to be verses 4 to 5. Secondly, their response, that's verse 6. Third, his miracles, that's verse 7. And finally, their joy, and that's verse 8. His message, we have a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy, a story of peace and light. A story of peace and light for the darkness shall turn to the dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. Well, in the early chapters, of Acts, we see that the ones who were bringing the message, the story, the preaching of the gospel were the apostles. But after the persecution broke out, it was all who were scattered who went about preaching the word, it says. Now, we know that it was the enemies of the church who caused the Christians in Jerusalem to flee for their lives. But behind and beyond their wicked intentions was God directing the events for his own purpose. 
They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Now, this was the first time that the church was scattered and the gospel went forth as a result of persecution, but it certainly wasn't going to be the last. The French Protestants, known as the Huguenots, were granted religious freedom by Henry IV of France under the Treaty of Nantes. But when Louis XIV, the one known as the Sun King, came to the throne, he first tried to convert the Huguenots to Catholicism by persuasion, but then by force. Some caved under the pressure, some stood firm and paid with their lives, but many more just fled the country, setting up new communities across Europe and Africa and America. The pilgrims, facing persecution in England, fled to Holland, where they were granted religious freedom. But after 10 years there, they decided in 1620 to leave. They didn't want their kids to grow up Dutch. So they took two ships, the Speedwell and the Mayflower, and uh, the Speedwell had to turn back because of problems it had, but the Mayflower went on and landed at Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts. Lovers of history are moved by God, the hand of God. He brings his people to the places he wants them to be to act as salt and light. I mean, think of how many people have been uprooted from the country of Ukraine and replanted by God elsewhere, many of whom who know the Lord are being witnesses in their new countries. You can be sure that whatever heartache and tragedy and loss God might bring into your life, he's still working to cause all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. So in difficulties and hardship, rather than asking the question, why me, why this? What you should ask is, what is God trying to teach me in this situation? How does he want me to serve him in the midst of this heartache? Well, whatever these new displaced Christians from Jerusalem fled to, they proclaimed the good news. And we don't know where they all went, but we know where one man went. We know where Philip went, because it says Philip went to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. Now, if you were a black person in the South in the 50s, there were some areas that you just best not go. If you're a white person today and your car were to break down in Gary, Indiana, you wouldn't want to get out. In the 1900s in New York City, the neighborhoods were ethnically divided. You didn't venture outside of your own community. It wasn't safe. Well, there was a lot of bad blood between the Jews and the Samaritans that went back for centuries. In 2 Kings chapter 17, we read about the defeat of the northern kingdom by the Assyrian king uh, Shalmaneser. After sacking the city, he, a large portion of the population was exiled uh, by the Assyrians and resettled in an area called Gozan in the Har uh, Har Hebar River in the towns of the Medes. That would be modern-day Iraq. Now, the Assyrians then took people from other parts of their empire and settled them in the land of northern kingdom. So these immigrants intermarried with the Israelites and remained in the land. And we're told in that chapter that they worshipped the Lord but they also served their own gods according to the customs of the nations from which they had been brought. You know, when I was a kid and you wanted to buy a dog, if you had some money, you could buy a purebred, a Dalmatian, a German Shepherd, maybe a Collie. If you didn't want to spend the money, you could always go out and buy what they called a mutt, a mixed breed. But you know what? Now people pay big bucks for mixed breed dogs. I mean, if you mix a Cocker Spaniel with a Poodle, you get a Cockapoo. You mix a golden retriever with a poodle and you get a golden doodle. But then if you mix a cockapoo with a golden doodle, doodle I think you get a cockadoodle doo, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, I, I came up with that my own. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Your pastor needs that encouragement. <laughs> How about when you mix a miniature wiener dog with a chihuahua? They actually have a name for it. They're called Chewinis. Now, I think that's funny because aren't those the things that you put in the little barbecue sauce in the crock pots? Whatever. Now, we laugh about dog breeds, but for the Jews, the fact that the Samaritans were racially and religiously mutts, half-breeds, was no laughing matter. May the Jews despise them. You remember when Jesus' listeners reacted negatively to his teaching, they responded by saying, you're a Samaritan and you're demon-possessed. In their mind, those two things were equated. But the hatred went both ways. About 120 years before Jesus, a Jewish leader named John Hyrcanus destroyed the Samaritan temple that was on Mount Gerizim. You recall that Jesus was heading up to Jerusalem one time, and when they found out that's where he was going and that he was a Jew, the Samaritans refused him entry into the city. Remember what James and John did? Hey, hey, Lord, you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn him up? 
Jesus said, you don't know what kind of spirit you have. Also, that woman at the well in Samaria when Jesus was there, she was shocked when Jesus talked to him. How can you, as a Jew, talk to me, a Samaritan woman? And then John says, for the Samaritans and the Jews had no dealing with each other. So as I said, Philip was going beyond the pale here. And why did he go? Was it for vacation, sightseeing, to do historical research? No. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. Now, I recall one well-known Christian apologist when I asked, what he understood to be the focus of his ministry, he said it was presenting a Christian worldview. Okay, there is a place for that. But what people need most is not a Christian worldview. They need Christ. It's not that we preach good views. It's that we preach good news, the good news of salvation that God has brought to us through his son, Jesus Christ. God created man to glorify him and uh, enjoy him forever. Adam and Eve sinned against God, rebelling against him, thinking that they themselves could decide what's right or wrong. Isn't that sound like our culture today? As a result, they plunged the human race into sin. But the same day that God pronounced judgment upon them, he promised the Savior for them, a descendant of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent, Satan, and restore man to his rightful place. God did that by sending his son into the world in human flesh, living a perfectly righteous life, and then offering up that life as a sacrifice for sins. On the cross, God poured out the wrath against sin of his people on Jesus. So Jesus took the punishment and paid the sin debt. And then when a person trusts in Jesus, Jesus' righteousness, his credit, our our record of good deeds, is credited to our account. And as a result of that, we can stand before God and he looks at us as if we had lived Jesus' life. And so now, anyone, Jew, Samaritan, Russian, American, red, yellow, black, and white, anyone who turns from their sins and trusts in Christ's death as the payment for their sin, God grants to them eternal life. We sing a song, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. Writing to the Corinthians, Paul said this, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 2. Now, Philip went beyond the pale because the Samaritans needed to hear about Jesus. That brings us to our second point, though, the response. This is verse 6. Bella Montoya. Her family was gathered around her casket at the funeral home. A 76-year-old woman who was a former nurse had died and her body was placed in a coffin and uh, her family was holding awake. Well, five hours into the vigil, they heard sounds coming from inside the casket, a rapping sound. According to her daughter, Barbara, as reported in Fox News, my mom was wrapped in sheets and she was hitting the coffin. And when we approached, we could see that she was breathing heavily. Doctors theorized that the cardiorespiratory arrest caused her mother to suffer what was called catalepsy, a trance-like state where the body becomes rigid and it's uh, decreased sensitivity to pain on several functions, including breathing slow way down. And I have to tell you, this is another reminder that there's a big difference between being dead and being mostly dead. Well, she was only mostly dead, not all the way dead. But the Bible teaches that all of us come into this world DOA, dead on arrival. In Ephesians 2, 4 to 5, it says this, God being rich in his mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. Now the Samaritans came alive spiritually as they listened to Philip's preaching because we read in verse 6, it says this, the crowds were of one accord giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. Now Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing hearing of the word of Christ. But the first responsibility when it comes to the word of God is simply to listen. Listen. After giving the parable of the soils, which speaks of the various responses to the gospel message, Jesus said this, So take care how you listen. For whoever whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away from him. I mean, you ever been on a plane? You get ready to take off. And then you have the flight attendants get up and they go through the safety protocols. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're glad that you're on board Flight 401 to London's Heathrow Airport. Before our departure, we would like you to give your attention to the cabin crew as they go through some of the safety features of our plane. Each seat has an overhead oxygen mask, which will drop in case of loss of cabin pressure. Put on the mask, activate it by pulling the hose. Blah, blah, blah. Have you ever looked around when they're doing that? Is anyone listening? Is anyone paying attention? Some of them are sleeping. But put yourself on the same plane, now it's up in the air, and what happens is there's a hijacker on it. The hijacker goes into the cabin and kills both the pilot and the co-pilot. He's going to dive it into the ground. But you and one other brave person go in there and incapacitate the man. Someone holds him down. But who's going to fly the plane now? You are. So you're sitting in the cockpit. They're coming over the radio, and they're trying to explain to you what you need to do as you're looking at all these dials and levers and gauges. As they were talking, how carefully would you listen to what they're saying? Would you be nodding off? Would you be thinking, oh, it's too warm in the cabin here? I don't know, do we get a breeze going on here? Now you'd be listening with laser focus. Why is that? Because you'd know what was at stake. Your life, the life of your family members, and the life of all the people in the plane. I want you to listen carefully, folks. When you come on Sunday morning, what's at stake is more than your life or death. It's heaven or hell. Because what you do in response to what you hear determines whether you perish or have eternal life. Well, we're told here that they were giving attention to what was being said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs he was performing. Whatever prejudice they had against this Jewish evangelist, they set it aside to hear the word of God. That brings us to our next point, though, the miracles. And this is verse 11. Carolyn Gable was a struggling single mom of two young children working at a restaurant. She applied for a sales job and she got it. And over time, not only became successful in that company, but also moved up and eventually became the owner of New Age Transportation, where she was the CEO of a $28 million logistics company. Now, she wrote a book entitled, Everything I, Knew I, Everything I Know as a CEO I Learned as a Waitress. <laughs> she purchased the property on Lake Geneva, and uh, she made a camp there where single parents can come with their kids for su- the summer camp. And uh, she started a foundation to raise money so the kids can go for free, and she named the foundation Expect a Miracle. Now, it's a worthy endeavor, and I'm sure that it's appreciated by the, king, uh, the uh, kids who attend and the single parents who send them. But the experience is not really a miracle, is it? I mean, a miracle in the Bible is a supernatural act of God where he intervenes in such a way as to transcend the ordinary laws of nature. I mean, getting your kids to eat their vegetables, that's not a miracle. Feeding 5,000 men and all their wives and children with just a few loaves and fish, that is a miracle. Well, in verse 4, or 6 here, we're told that the Samaritans were giving attention to what was being said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. And then in verse 8, we're told that some of those signs, what they were, the miracles he was performing. It says, For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of him and shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lamed were healed. By the way, part of the reason that the Jews labeled Jesus as demon-possessed and a Samaritan, connecting those two, is because the Samaritans were involved in a lot of witchcraft, as evidenced by this story here. You know, one of the groups that was targeted by ISIS uh, in that war after the Iraq army collapsed was the uh, Yazidis. Now, the Yazidis are considered to be apostates by other Muslims, and they accuse them of being devil worshippers. And when uh, Justin Schremeck was here a couple of years ago, I asked him, is that true? He said, oh yeah, they're devil worshippers. They worship someone they call the peacock angel, but the peacock angel is none other than Satan himself. Well, many Jews down through the ages have themselves been involved in the occult. Magic incantations, amulets, um, and and, uh, Kabbalah, all this mysticism. It's in the case that they were actually more like the Samaritans than they wanted to admit. Well, wherever you find people dabbling with uh, witchcraft and the occult, you'll find demonic activity and even demon possession. That's what you had here in Samaria. But as the gospel came forward and it was being preached, the Holy Spirit was displaying uh, his, his power and the forces of evil were being beaten back and these demons going out were shrieking in terror as they left that area. Well, not only spiritual oppression was lifted, but also freedom from physical ailments. It says, and many who were, being, were paralyzed and lame were healed. 
Now, by definition, a miracle is a rare event. But God does at times intervene in powerful ways, especially when the gospel goes into a new area. And here, when Philip ventured in beyond the pale into Samaria to proclaim Christ, the forces of evil received a mighty bow and were beaten back. Well, what was the result? Results found in verse 8. It was their rejoicing. And so, so there was much rejoicing in that city. You know, in the Disney cartoon, Robin Hood, when the characters are in prison, the rooster's playing his lute, remember? And he's singing that doleful song. Every town has its ups and downs. Sometimes the ups outnumber the downs. But not in Nottingham. I'm inclined to believe if we weren't so up or down, we'd up and leave. We'd up and fly if we had wings for flying. Can't you see the tears were crying? Can't there be some happiness for me? Not in Nottingham. And I watched a video the other day about San Francisco. And at one time, this was one of the most beautiful cities in the United States. Now it's an empty shell of its former glory. Businesses have closed out, moved on. Buildings are boarded up. The streets are lined with tents of homeless people, most of whom are drug addicts or suffering mental illness. There's needles and garbage and human feces everywhere. And if you want to see degradation that comes from sin, just walk down the city streets. And the politicians? Well, all the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put Humpty back together again. Now, I don't know how dirty the streets were in Samaria, but those people were just as lost as those in San Francisco. But when the Samaritans heard and believed the gospel, everything changed. In Romans 1, 16 to 17, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is being revealed from faith to faith, even as it's written, the just shall live by faith. The gospel alone, when believed, can transform lives, heal relationships, and bring peace, not only between man and God, but also between man and man. What the Samaritans needed, what San Francisco needs, what you and I need, is to have the righteousness of God transform our lives. And when the spiritual liberation takes place, then we all can say, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. You know, when the victory was over, over the Nazis, forces was announced that people all over Europe waved flags, rang bells, and danced in the street and shouted for joy. There were shouts of joy in heaven when the angels saw the Samaritans come to faith in Christ. And there will be joy, great rejoicing, in the city as these half-breed mongrels became pure-blooded children of God through faith in Christ. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread that gladness all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone all around and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Let me ask him questions as we close up here. Have you heard the good news and responded to it in faith? Do you understand the gospel message that I just gave? That if you trust in Christ as the payment for your sin, not trusting in your religiosity, not trusting in the good deeds that you do, not trusting the fact that you're baptized or you're confirmed or you go to church or you're a church member, but trusting Christ's death as the payment for your sin, you'll have eternal life as a free gift. If you try to earn it, you insult God. If you receive it as a gift, you honor him and his son. Have you received the gift of eternal life? Secondly, are you spreading this good news to your family members, your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends? I mean, think about it. God has placed you in a certain area, and the circle of influence you have is not the same as any other person in the world. What difference are you making in that circle? A lot of times what we do is we wait for the perfect opportunity to witness to somebody. It never comes. Third thing I want to ask is this. Are you willing to step outside your comfort zone and go beyond the pale to reach those you wouldn't normally associate with? Who would that be for you? Who are the people you're like, ugh. Maybe God wants to use you to reach those people. You know, our days are short. Our time is limited. 
And the opportunities we have to get out the good news to Jesus are going to be gone soon. Are you making a difference where you're at? Are you shining the light of the gospel that people might see and believe and be saved? Jesus said that he was the light of the world, but he also said that to his followers that you are the light of the world. May God give us the grace to shine. Let's pray. Our Father and God, you know that song that we sing, Tell Me the Old, Old Story. And it is an old story, but it's a true story, and it's the great news that we can have reconciliation with you through the death of your son. You've done everything necessary for us to have eternal life. So, Father and God, we pray that uh, you would give us grace both to respond to the message and then to spread it to other people. Because uh, Philip did that, and with a great result of people coming to know Christ. And we pray that you'd help us in the weeks to come to think about people that we can witness to and how we might go about it, Lord, so that they hear the gospel as well. So bless us to that end, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.